Last week, the Bank of Canada released their Financial Stability Report, where they outlined the biggest risks to the Canadian economy. And there's something important that not a lot of people are talking about. Some indicators of financial stress have risen. At the same time, the valuations of some financial assets appear to have become stretched. This could increase the risk of a sharp correction that could generate system-wide stress. The Bank of Canada's new report raises red flags. They warn of two major issues. One, unfair treatment. Canada's rich and poor are being treated differently, which is a big concern. Two, risky bet by the wealthy. Canada's wealthy are making a risky gamble that could hurt everyone's savings and investments. We'll tackle the unfairness first, then dive into the risky bet and potential economic fallout. We have seen a rise in financial stress. Uh, survey evidence suggests that the stress is more concentrated in renters. In contrast, if you look at mortgage holders, uh, indicators of, of, of financial stress actually have changed very little and remain quite low. This might seem confusing. Homeowners with big mortgages have access to lower interest debt consolidation tools, while renters with less debt might struggle with high interest rates. It's not about the total debt amount, but the type of debt and access to better interest rates. Hold on, something's not right. Renters are getting squeezed, even though homeowners have bigger mortgages. Sounds unfair, right? We'll break down the shocking reason behind this and why it matters to you. First, I want to show you that this actually is the case. This chart shows a bunch of different types of credit products, both credit cards as well as auto loans, and compares that between um, people who have mortgages and people who do not have mortgages and shows you OK of those people. What percentage of them are not paying their loans off anymore? Which percent of loans are in AAR or are delinquent? You can see that over the past two years, delinquent loans have ticked up in every single category, but far, uh, more so for renters here, we can see these top two lines. This is the, uh, the credit cards for people without a mortgage. Uh, more of them are in heirs as well as auto loans, and less so for mortgage holders, both for credit cards and for auto loans. So why is it that renters who have taken on less debt and might be more financially responsible as a result of that? How come they're getting the bum end of the stick? The data highlights a potential disparity between homeowners and renters when it comes to managing debt. Homeowners have an advantage because they can leverage their property's equity. Products like home equity lines of credit, HELOCs, offer lower interest rates compared to typical consumer debt for cars or credit cards. This allows homeowners to consolidate high interest debts into a single, lower rate payment. Renters, on the other hand, lack access to such debt consolidation tools tied to real estate. They're left managing potentially high interest debt without the option to potentially reduce their overall interest burden. This lack of access to these financial tools could put renters at a significant disadvantage when dealing with debt, especially compared to homeowners who might benefit from this potential policy shift. It's that time and time again the government caters to homeowners providing relief to them when times are tough and letting them see the benefits of appreciation in their home values. When times aren't so tough, it's no wonder that Canada has these insane real estate prices when the government policies that we see especially new ones that we're going to look at in a second, are constantly telling you to borrow more and to stretch yourself to buy as much real estate as you can. And I think this makes my point very clear. This is a section of the recent 2024 budget released just about a month ago from the federal government uh, called the Enhancement to the Canadian Mortgage Charter. Inside of this, they have a lot of rules that are supposed to help mortgage holders out time and time again. We've talked on the channel about how big banks are allowing for amortization extensions, essentially extending the amount of time that homeowners have to pay off their loan while also forcing them to pay higher interest, but as a result, reducing the monthly payment so that they can actually make ends meet in the short term. Well, it seems that these amortization extensions that the big banks have been offering 
Well, they're getting codified in a Canadian mortgage charter. Um, they talk about a potential shift in mortgage relief measures. Lenders might be expected to offer permanent solutions, including extending amortization periods to 30, 35, or even 40 years. This would significantly lower monthly payments for homeowners struggling to make ends meet. However, there's a trade-off. While a smaller monthly payment offers immediate financial relief, it comes at a cost. Stretching out the loan term over decades means homeowners will end up paying much more interest over the entire repayment period. In simpler terms, while this helps with short-term cash flow, it benefits the banks in the long run as they collect more interest on the loan. Big bet alert! Canadians and companies are borrowing billions to gamble on bond prices. This risky move could hurt everyone, even if you're not involved. The Bank of Canada is worried and wants to prevent a financial mess. While the video mentions renters not getting the same help as homeowners, the bigger concern is the overall economic risk. Stay tuned for future breakdowns. Talking about this chart shows how many months of income people have in savings or liquid investments like stocks. And they use this as a measure to say like, OK, well, how much of a buffer do people have? How many months of runway do they have of income before they would run out of funds? And they show this in two or in three different time periods. The blue ones are from before the pandemic. The yellow is from early 2023. And the green is from early 2024 just recently. And you can see a pretty big discrepancy here. Of course, renters having far less in terms of savings and, uh, and stocks that could hold them over homeowners with a mortgage are in a little bit of a better position, and homeowners that have their house paid outright, or homeowners without a mortgage, while of course they're in the best situation. But the Bank of Canada uses this data to say even though there are these discrepancies between the different classes or different types of Canadians, well actually, for each of these individual classes, they're actually in a better place than they were before the pandemic. Just compare the blue before the pandemic to the green after the pandemic? Uh, in all cases this has gone up, meaning that average Canadians have more in savings and in liquid assets than they did before the pandemic. So they use this to say that, well, Canadians are actually better off than they were before the pandemic. But personally, I don't buy it, and I don't like this chart at all. Um, because this is measuring the amount of months of after-tax income people have accessible to them. But what it doesn't account for is for the incredible inflation that we've seen since 2019. And it also doesn't account for the fact that wages haven't kept up with that. So when we're measuring things in months of after-tax income, uh, well, that's not a very good measure compared to how wages have grown significantly less than the cost of living has grown. I don't buy that Canadians are better off now than they were four years ago. Hold on, there's a bigger risk. Canada's big players, wealthy individuals, hedge funds and even pension plans are borrowing billions to make a risky bet on bond prices. But if this backfires, the Bank of Canada warns, it could hurt not just them, but everyday Canadians too. Now in the Financial Stability Report, the Bank of Canada said, that there's one thing that has the biggest risk of spreading out and creating a sharp downturn in markets, and it all has to do with this big bet that's being made by fund managers, and it could impact everybody. But what exactly are these fund managers betting on? Well, they're betting on interest rates going down for a while now. It's been the consensus that rates would begin to decline marginally this year. So of course these firms think, hmm, knowing that I believe that to be the case, how can I make some money on it? The answer in their eyes is bonds. As a quick refresher, you'll remember that bonds and interest rates are very tightly linked together. In fact, the prices of bonds have a large impact on what the average interest rates are that you and I pay on any kind of credit that we take out. And as the price of bonds go up, the interest rates that those bonds pay and that we pay in the economy tend to go down. And the inverse is the same as bond prices go down while interest rates tend to go up. So if big hedge funds wanted to speculate that interest rates would in fact come down well, then they could make money on that 
by buying up a bunch of bonds, knowing that, hey, the price of those bonds, well, that's going to go up if interest rates go down. Just buying bonds isn't enough for these big players. They're also making extra bets that bond prices will go up. They do this by selling something called a futures contract, promising to buy bonds later at a set price. They get paid for this promise. Imagine it as a double-down bet on bond prices rising. But even that's not enough. They borrow billions to increase their potential profits, but also their risk. The Bank of Canada isn't happy about this. We do express some concern that you know, basically the way you make money, on you don't make very much money on any one trade. There's a small discrepancy. You make a small amount of money. So in order to make this uh, worthwhile, you need to do a lot of it. And to do a lot of it, you need to borrow. The problem. These bets are profitable only in large volumes, requiring massive borrowing. While things are smooth, it's all good. But if something unexpected happens, it can trigger a domino effect. Here's why. We've seen, we, so we've seen an increase in borrowing, particularly in repo markets uh, of hedge funds. And in the event that there was a sudden repricing, a, a sudden change in, in uh, bond prices, big change in, in yields, um, there could be a situation where, uh, either because of margin calls or a need to unwind those trades, um, they could have to sell the bonds uh, into a weak market, and that could really amplify, um, amplify uh, the market swing. But what if the bet goes bad? Firms could face margin calls, meaning they urgently need to repay loans used for the trade. They might sell bonds to cover this, but that pushes bond prices down further. This creates a downward spiral as others holding similar bets are forced to sell too, impacting everyone in the system. If you get sharp changes in policy or really unexpected events, um, it usually affects that sentiment or expectations portion of stretch valuations. And you can get a sharp repricing, and then that's where issues like leverage create a sort of knock-on effect, right? So leverage amplifies a price change. And, and so back to sort of the early, earlier comment and, and the governor's comment just now, so how do you protect against that? You make sure you've got margins or, or buffers and you make sure that you're thinking through the potential impacts of those changes um, and that you're, you're prepared if you get that large swing in price. But what if things go wrong? An expert warns that a sudden policy shift or surprise event could trigger higher interest rates and inflation. This would hurt those who bet on low rates. The high borrowing could lead to a bigger than expected drop in asset values, like stocks. Her advice, hold more cash as a safety net, but many borrowers might not be prepared for this worst case scenario. So, this downward bond spiral, why should you care? Even if you're not invested in bonds, it could affect you. If firms can't sell enough bonds to cover their loans, they might be forced to sell other assets, like stocks in companies you or I might be invested in. This selling could drive down stock prices, impacting your portfolio even if you weren't directly in bonds. So as a result of these hedge funds and these pension plan investment funds, making these giant bets on something that they think is a sure thing, well, they're actually taking on a lot of risk for average Canadians. Um, if this plays out, how the Bank of Canada is saying, it could the risk of a steep downturn is even more so if the Bank of Canada is right about what they're saying in this section of the report about asset valuations, the prices of different stocks and different assets in the market. They say that the valuations or the prices of them uh, appear to have become stretched or too high, is what the Bank of Canada is saying here, which increases the risk of a sharp correction downward that can generate system-wide stress and the recent rise in leverage in the non-bank financial intermediation sector, that's exactly what we just talked about, could amplify the effects of such a correction. The Bank of Canada warns of stretched asset valuations but the report lacks data. They simply say prices are high without comparing them to historical metrics. 
this raises a question. Are they just trying to influence the economy by making people wary of risky investments? By highlighting potential problems, they might discourage excessive borrowing and cool down the market. This seems more like a message than a data-driven analysis. We discussed potential impacts on Canadians, but what should you do? Honestly, nothing drastic. Predicting the market is nearly impossible. Focus on long-term investing with your spare cash. Over time, those short-term dips won't matter much. Keep investing regularly, dollar cost averaging, into a diversified mix of index ETFs within tax-advantaged accounts like TFSAs or RRSPs. This maximizes your returns while minimizing taxes. Remember, this isn't personalized financial advice. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope it helped you out at least a little bit, and I'll see you next time.